Uh, okay, so recording has started. So hi, once again, everyone. Really awesome to see you all here. Uh, today we have a very special event because we usually do very internal kind of commu community events. And today we have an external guest, which is an amazing person who is like head of developer relations in Fusion Auth. And today his topic is JSON Web Tokens and what devs need to know about them. I don't want to take too much time from Dan. I guess he's good enough to introduce himself. Uh, so Dan, the stage is yours. I'm happy to mute myself and you can lead it as you feel to lead it. Uh, by the end of the call, I will just ask questions. Uh, I will just you know, follow the chat and ask questions so you don't have to do that. So I'll manage this stuff up. Perfect. Great. Okay. Awesome. Um, let me share my screen and, you know, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate the chance to chat with y'all. So, um, as Vadim mentioned, we're going to talk about um, something that I've got a lot of experience with, which is uh, JSON Web Tokens. So, we're going to talk about what devs need to know and real quick about my employer because I am doing this on my employer's time and my employer does a lot of jots. Um, we are basically an authentication and authorization platform. We're very similar to Auth0. Uh, we have some differences that we think are, are good differences. Uh, particularly, uh, we have a free edition that you can run as many users as you want on as long as you host it yourself because we're also downloadable software. So it's a little bit of a different model as opposed to Auth0 being a SaaS solution. We're both SaaS and downloadable. And we just take off, off, take off, off your plate is the big thing. So you can work on, you know, features that users actually want to pay you for. We'll talk about me. Thank you for that intro, Vadim. But really, you didn't come here to, to learn about me. You came here to learn about JSON Web Tokens. So let's talk about what I'm gonna cover. We're gonna do a brief overview of JSON Web Tokens, and then we'll kind of dig deep into the problem that they solve. We'll talk about validation of JSON Web Tokens. We'll talk about some of the attributes of bearer tokens. Um, JSON Web Tokens are often used as bearer tokens, and we'll talk about what that means, uh, although they're, they're a subset of bearer tokens. We'll also talk about common issues. I like to call them foot guns because they let you shoot yourself in the foot. We'll cover refresh tokens, which I think are a really important part of the JSON Web Token experience. And then we'll talk about revocation and what your options are around that. So. Let's talk. Let's dive in. Let's talk about uh, JSON Web Tokens briefly. Um, JWT stands for JSON Web Token. It actually is pronounced JOT as per the specification. It is a standard. You can go look at this uh, if you need some bedtime reading to put you to sleep. RFC 7519 defines JSON Web Tokens and it builds on a couple of other RFCs. It's really important to understand that there's two main classes of JSON Web Tokens. There are classes that are signed, right? So that means, and we'll dive more into this, but that means basically that you, the contents are cryptographically signed and that signature is part of the JSON web token so that you can verify the integrity of it. The other option is an encrypted JSON web token where the contents are encrypted. And the main difference between these two is that with signed JSON web tokens, you can be sure that the message didn't change over the wire that no one intercepted it, that no one was able to create one. But with signed JSON Web Tokens, it's not, the, the contents are not hidden. Whereas with encrypted Web Tokens, you get all of the value of signed JSON Web Tokens, but the contents are actually hidden or part of the contents are hidden. Uh, most of my experience and most of what I've seen in the wild is signed JSON Web Tokens. So that's the focus of this talk, but it's worth noting that there are both options out there and they're both defined. Uh, J JSON Web Tokens or JOTs are often used as stateless portable tokens of identity. What does that mean? That means stateless means that they can be verified without contacting any central server. Portal means that they are easily put into um, a format that can be shipped around over HTTP in a very friendly manner. So it doesn't include um, things that don't go into URLs or things that aren't good form parameters or other things like that. And then in particular, they're used to represent a, a person or an entity. So oftentimes a server will authenticate somebody and then generate a JSON web token that represents that person. And that can be passed around to other systems that might be interested in knowing who that person is, what, they, what access they have. 
because of that, they're great for APIs and microservices because they allow you to kind of decouple the authentication process and the authorization process from the um, validation or the, the delivery of data or, or features or functionality. And because they're standard, because they've been around for a while, I think 7519 was a 2017 RFC. Uh, a lot of identity providers, including FusionAuth, generate them. And they're widely supported. And I don't just mean by the identity providers. They're also supported in terms of documentation, in terms of knowledge, in terms of libraries. I have not run into a single major language that didn't have at least one open source JSON web token processing library. And so that is really useful if you want to build a system on top of that, because uh, it lets you take care of the validation of this cryptographically signed token without writing the code yourself. So let's talk about the problem that JSON web tokens or JOTs are designed. And this is one problem. I've seen JOTs in a lot of different places. This is the problem I'm most familiar with. And so we're gonna kind of dive into how they solve this particular problem. We have a microservices based to do application here. So we have our clients over there on the left. We have a couple of APIs, one of which stores uh, is responsible for user data. The other is responsible for to-do data. And I'm gonna say upfront that this is probably over-architected for this particular problem space, but you can imagine that you might have more than just two APIs in your application. So the user's API looks like this, right? The data store has users and roles. The to-do API just has to-dos. The to-dos database might look a little bit something like this, where you have a, uh, you know, the to-do text. We have a status for the to-do. It's an enum. Um, and then we have a user ID. And it's important to note that the user ID is not a foreign key. So it's not tied. You can't, you can't um, walk to the user table from the to-do table. It has to be passed in. So our problem is we want to um, get the to-dos for a user, which usually starts with a login screen. And then we want to say, well, how do we get from the user to the to-dos of that user? And that's this, the problem that Jots can help you with. So let's, let, let's walk through some solutions. The first one, again, we're gonna post that login screen, uh, post that login endpoint that's part of the user API. And the user API is gonna look up the user's data, right? It's gonna verify those credentials. And obviously, if the user is not logged, uh, doesn't provide the correct credentials, username, and password, whatever else, the user API is not gonna return anything, but let's say that they do provide the correct credentials. Then uh, we, dealt, we pull out the user data, we pass that back to the client, and then the client receives something that looks a little bit like this, right? It has an ID, it has a name, um, other information about the user who has authenticated. Then to get our to-dos, the client could peel off that user ID and then pass that user ID to the to-do API. The to-do API would then look up the to-dos, right? Because somehow we have to get that user ID because we don't have a direct link because we have separate data stores. Now, is this a good idea? No, this is not a good idea. This is a really bad idea. Um, and the reason for that is, excuse me, the reason for that is that the, uh, a client who receives uh, that JSON and peels off that user ID and passes it to API might get some, get too big for its britches. Uh, it might get, um, how do I put this? It might realize that it doesn't seem like the to-do API is doing any validation on the user ID. And so it might just say, oh, well, I'm gonna go ahead and try different user IDs so I can get other to-dos, right? And so I could try user ID one, two, three, four, and get everyone's to-dos, which is obviously a huge security risk, not a good practice and not what we want to have happen. So that's kind of a naive approach. So I wouldn't implement that. Let's take, let's take a, a second approach. With this approach, we actually have the user API generate a token. And that token can just be a long string, a long random string that gets passed to the client. The client passes it to the to-do API. And that to-do API now doesn't, can't, can't look up, that, 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 that string can't be the user ID. 
Because if it's the user ID and it's directly tied into the to-dos data store, then we have run into that same enumeration problem, right? It's a less chance of a malicious client enumerating to that token, but it's still a possibility. So what we do instead is we have the to-do API pass that token to the user API, and then the user API responds back with the, the user data. And if the token's valid, if the token's invalid because someone, a malicious client's like messing with stuff, then the user API returns back nothing and the two API returns an error. So this moves the, uh, this, this solves the issue, right? We have a situation where we have a token and the uh, user API is going to verify that token for us. And then once we have that user's JSON, we're sure that things are all on the up and up, and then we can get the to-dos for that user based on that user ID. So this is what I call the opaque token approach, and it's a very valid approach. It, but it does have some trade-offs, right? This is engineering, everything has trade-offs. So we have to have a user token mapping that has to be maintained someplace. And it can be very chatty because basically every time a request comes in with a token, we need to pass that to the user API. That obviously also introduces a lot of coupling. And that means that every time the user API has downtime for whatever reason, right? Availability, upgrade, whatever, we're going to have downtime the rest of our application because a, a request comes in. If you can't get the user ID from that token, you're kind of dead in the water. Um, it is worth noting that this is supported by the standard. This is an RFC. So JOTS can help us with this particular problem, right? The, the, the naive approach with just not doing any checking at all is a bad idea. The opaque token approach works, but it has some trade-offs. So let's talk about how JSON web tokens fit in this picture. So with a JSON web token, the user API generates and signs the JSON web token. And then that gets past the client. The client passes it to the to-do API. And because of the properties of JSON web tokens, because of the stateless nature of it, because it's signed, the to-do API can trust the data that, that is in there. And then it looks at the data, right? It validates the signature and does another validation, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And then it pulls off the... Uh, user ID and can look that up in the dos. So the attack vector of a malicious client is not going to work because if that client changes the JSON web tokens contents, the signature won't match. And then the to-do API won't go any further, but it solves the problem of the opaque token issue because the to-do API doesn't actually have to talk to the user API to validate the token. That is the big win for JSON web tokens. And if you only take one thing away from the talk, that's why you would choose JSON web tokens. If you're in a situation where you want to trust the content, but you don't want to continually talk to some central server to validate the content. It can be, uh, JOTS can be signed in a couple of different ways. And another benefit of JOTS is that they can contain more than just um, kind of a binary or they can contain interesting information because they're, they're contained JSON. You can put in roles, um, user account type, um, all kinds of other interesting information in there. And we're going to dive into that in a little bit. So let's take a look at a jot, right? I've shown you some architecture diagrams. I've kind of walked you through the problem space. Let's talk about jots themselves. So this is a JOT in all its glory. This is a signed JOT, right? Again, remember there's encrypted JOTs, which we're not gonna talk about. This is a signed JOT. Signed JOTs have three things in them. The first is a header, that's in green. Second is the payload or the body, that's in blue. And the third is a signature, which is in tan or white there. So each of these, uh, sorry, each of the first two things, the header, and the body are just URL encoded JSON. That's why it's, they both start with the EYJ0 because that is, or the EYJ, hmm, interesting. Um, I need to update the slide. Uh, they both start with uh, EY because that is the, um, 
the curly brace. So anyway, this is the header. The header is metadata about the jot. It's the algorithm that is used to sign the jot. Yeah, there's a type header, which is the um, type of the JSON web token. And various standards actually have different T uh, different type keys. And then there's other data that can go in there. But this is really just information about the jot, not stuff that's probably interesting to your business application. The payload is where you really want to spend a lot of time, right? You want to understand this. And this, again, is a JSON object. The keys of the JSON object in this world are called claims. Um, I don't know why they chose that particular nomenclature, but um, they are claims about the principal or the user that um, is holding this shot, right? The entity that's holding this shot. And the important thing to note about this slide is that you, again, because it's JSON, you aren't restricted to just um, primitives, right? Strings or numbers, you can have rich data structures. So this roles is an array, but you can have an array of objects, an object of arrays, or an object of object of objects, right? As long as you want to um, nest things, you can. The other thing that's worth noting is that there are some claims that are standardized. ISS is one. It's the issuer, it's who created this JSON web token. Other claims are not. Roles are not standardized. And you can basically add your own custom claims as, as many as you want. The signature is, again, the thing that verifies the integrity of the JSON web token. The way the signature is generated is basically you take the header, you take the body, you separate them with a period, you run them through a cryptographic operation, which generates a signature. And the kind of operation really depends on the algorithm that you choose. And we're going to talk more about those in a while. Let's talk about validation of JSON web tokens. And this is really important. So this is something that you want to make sure you do every time you see a JSON web token. And this is something that is done by the to-do API, right? It's done by anybody that receives a JSON web token. So I'm not gonna talk a ton about the user API and how they generate them. Um, again, very often you're just kind of, uh, that, that operation is dictated by somebody else, right? Somebody else has an identity provider. You're just consuming the JSON web tokens that they provide. But let's talk about the to-do API. And this is something that you have to do every time you receive a JSON web token. The first thing you need to do absolutely 100% is validate the signature. And you know, I wanna say use the library. I've already mentioned that JSON web tokens ha have a wide set of supporting libraries. Please don't do this yourself. Um, and if you see a signature that is tampered with, right, where the contents of the JSON web token don't match the signature, don't go forward, right? That's the very first step you should do. And because it's so critical, that's why I advocate using a library. The next thing you need to do is validate the claims of the JSON web token. So this is business logic because some claims are gonna be custom. Some claims are gonna matter more than others. There's some library support out there for validating some of the standardized claims, but very often you're gonna to have to write your own library or your own layer on top of it. Of it. And it's not complicated. We're going to see some code in a little bit. Then I'll walk you through kind of validating claims. But um, it's something you need to do. You absolutely need to do it. So just want to kind of reemphasize that you're going to need to write some claim validation logic. So let's talk about some of the standardized claims that you will want to validate. And again, there's varying levels of library support for this, but it's mostly the validation you know, I don't want to make it too scary. It's basically just checking to see that strings match uh, from, you know, you pull it out from the, the JSON web token and you want to match against the expected value. So the issuer is the first one that you want to validate. You don't want to be consuming JSON web tokens willy nilly. You want to know that it came from a source that you trust, right? So in the scenario that I walked through, the user API is the issuer of the JSON web token of the JOT. The next one you wanna check, and this is a claim that is often supported by libraries, is the expiration claim. Because JSON web tokens are, are stateless, they're, uh, they don't really have, um, you don't have a way to check whether they're valid. So the way that they solve that is they 
make them time bound. So uh, JSON Web Tokens are only good for a certain period of time. And the expiration time is the time past which they are no longer valid. So the way to check this is look at the time that's right now. And by the way, this is in seconds since the Unix epic. Um, look at the time that is now. If the expiration time is in the future, the job is all good. If the expiration time is not in the future, then it's an expired token. You shouldn't move forward. The third claim that you're going to want to check typically is the audience claim. And this is who the JOT is for. So in the scenario we walked through, right, the toy application that I was talking about, it's the to-do API. And what you want to make sure, why you want to test this, this JOT is for you is you could imagine that the user API actually is going to create JOTs for a lot of different APIs. And it's possible that the, the contents of the JSON web token will differ. The uh, roles might differ. They might be the same, but an admin role in the to-do API might give you access to certain to-dos. An admin role in the accounting API might give you the ability to like write a check to somebody or send some money. Obviously, you want to make sure that the accounting API is checking to see that any JSON web tokens are generated uh, that, are, that, are, that it receives were intended for it. Otherwise, it might be somebody trying to escalate their privilege or, or it might just be a misconfiguration. So always check your audience. So let's take a brief look at some code. And this is an example application that I wrote a number of years ago, or I guess it wasn't a number of years ago, a number of months ago. And uh, basically, and, and by the way, the link will be in the, at the very end, I have the link to this. So you can download this and play, play with it yourself, but it's using a JSON web token library from NPM. And this encapsulates, encapsulates both the user API and the to-do API in our um, examples. So I really should say user API. Um, the user API is lines three through 14. Again, this is a demo <laughs> piece of code. This is not, you know, typically you're going to have those be in separate worlds, right? Separate servers, possibly even separate organizations. So the user API is on lines uh, four and four through 13 is just generating a JSON web token. So let's go ahead and change this to danexample.com. We're going to make this good for five minutes, not 60. And we have an issuer, we have an audience, and then we're signing it with a, a key. So this key is going to, again, give us that signature that will let us verify the integrity of this. And then lines 18 on are our consumer of the, the JSON web token, what is going to receive the JSON web token and needs to verify it. So here we're saying we know the algorithm, we want to double check the issuer, and we are going to make sure that the, uh, so sorry, this issuer check is, I should have formatted this before the talk. Um, this issuer check is example of the library and uh, doing the check for us, right? So the library is going to say, hey, make sure that the issue is fusionauth.io and make sure that you don't ignore expiration. I don't even know why that's an option. You should never ignore expiration, but that's how it is. And then, so that's an example where library is doing some verif verification checks, which is gonna give us back a JSON object, but we can do our own as well. So we can check to see, let's go ahead and add in, Premium user false. So first we're gonna say it's true. All right. So we're going to go ahead and run this. Huh. 
Oh, wait. If not, always check your constants. So there we are. So we have a, a JSON web token, and you can see that we get. Actually, I want to show you the uh, token right there. So here's our token. And you can see how this is very URL friendly. And then that basically turns into this code, right? Or this JSON object. So you can see how that's useful that we're sure that uh, somebody else generated this and that we know the signature is valid. Let's go ahead and change premium user to be false. And we will, because let's, you know, let's just assume that we want to make sure that no one is who's not a premium user is accessing this particular API. We do that, we get the invalid access, we can catch that and deny access to our API. So that is uh, uh, an example of a kind of the validation process and what you're gonna wanna think about when you get a JSON web token. All right. So let's talk a little bit about bearer tokens. So JSON web tokens are often used as bearer tokens. And the issue with bearer tokens is that anybody who gets them can use them. They're kind of like a car key or a house key. If you have a token, then you can present it to the to-do API and that to-do API will act as if uh, it won't know the difference between somebody who is a bad actor and somebody who's uh, the valid holder of the token. So you need to be careful about protecting these. Um, you know, you want to store them carefully and the best place to store them is often on the server side. And this is known as the back end for front end pattern. Oftentimes though, you do want to push it down to a client because you want, you know, the scalability and that stateless access. And if you do that, we recommend an HTTP only secure cookie. You want to watch out for cross site scripting in that case. You also want to watch out for like physical store uh, exploits because it's a cookie. You can open up developer tools and see the cookie and take it. Um, you can also use secure storage on mobile. So let's talk about some common issues that come up with uh, JSON web tokens. The first is not doing validation correctly. Again, use a library, especially take care of the signatures, but realize that you can't just use a library and, and be hands off. You need to check your own claims as well. And I walked you through some of that previously. Another issue that we run into is you don't want to put secrets into a JSON web token. All it is is basic for encoded JSON. If anybody looks at it, if anybody can see it, if it gets logged to a log file, if it gets stored in a cache someplace, um, somebody can see it. They can see the internals of it. The integrity of a JSON token that's signed is guaranteed, but the secrecy is not. And you might have noticed that a lot of the uh, values of the JSON web token that we walked through weren't integers, they were UUIDs. And the reason for that is that you can actually, if you put in an integer, it leaks information. If I see someone's user ID is 42, I have a pretty good idea how many people are in that system, or at least a, a lower bound. You wanna make sure that using the HMAC, you wanna use a really good key. This, uh, boop. Uh, yeah. On line four, this right here is a horrible key. <laughs> Please don't use this. Again, this is example application. You really want to use a nice, long, random string, like 128 characters or whatnot, because the issue with a key like this, or worse, you know, a key like this, is it can be cracked. And there's actually um, open source software out there that basically tries to brute force the key, right? It just tries a bunch of different keys. And if it generates a signature, sorry, it takes a JSON web token, it looks at the contents of it, and then it iterates over those, and then it iterates over a key space to generate a signature. And if it finds a signature that matches the signature in the JSON web token, congrats, your key is now out there in the wild. And that is a bad idea because now people can sign their own JSON web tokens without um, and, and basically present themselves, um, present those JSON web tokens 
sorry, let me re- rephrase this. They can sign their own JSON Web tokens, and anybody that accepts JSON Web tokens signed with that key won't have any idea that it's different, right? So they can create their own JSON Web tokens with their own uh, claims, claiming to be somebody else or claiming to have a different set of roles, and your to do API will happily accept them. I played with this, I downloaded it once. And if you have a four character HMAC, it takes like 30 seconds to, to walk through that space. If you have a long one, it's going to take a lot longer. So uh, if you're using uh, symmetric keys, which is HMAC, you want to make sure that you don't, uh, you pick a long, nice long key. Don't ever use the none algorithm. Uh, that basically means that there's no signature. So that means that you don't have any guarantees about the integrity. This is a very, uh, unfortunately, this is a valid JSON web token. This is a token with no signature, right? You can see you have the header and the body, but no signature. And this is just saying, um, you know, anybody who consumes this, basically <laughs> anybody can create any body or any payload they want. Again, that's a, it's a similar attack as if you uh, published your symmetric key. Uh, anybody can create any JSON web token against that, that your API will consume, which is kind of a bad idea. It's basically unsanitized credentials. Let's talk about asymmetric key pairs. So here's our system again, right? We have the JSON web token that's generated by the user API, past the client, and then the to-do API consumes that JSON web token. In all the previous examples, kind of an unstated assumption was that the signer of the JSON web token had a secret and the two API has that same secret. And we, again, we saw that in this code. Uh, they both use that HMAC key. The HMAC key is used to sign the JSON web token on line 14 and on line 26, it's used to verify it. So secret that is passed between the user API and the two API, or it's shared between them. Asymmetric key pairs avoid this. With an asymmetric key pair, you have a private key that's held by the user API that signs the JSON web token and a public key that verifies it. Um, why does this matter? Two reasons, scale and, and security. So scale, Basically, if you have a shared secret, you have a hard time. You're going to have a hard time sharing it between uh, teams, between different departments, between different organizations. With an asymmetric situation, you actually can have one organization, ABC here, that signs the JSON Web Token with a private key, and they can publish the public key. And another organization can verify that that key was signed by the correct uh, by by the private key, the private key. So that just allows you to scale things out a lot more. If you have a shared secret, you have to somehow distribute a secret between org ABC and org DEF. You're going to have a, a get in a world of hurt, especially if you scale out to multiple different organizations. The security aspect is a little bit different. Basically, and this is this kind of speaks back to the picking a long HMAC key. Um, if you have the shared secret, the secret that is used to sign the JSON web token is also what's used to verify it. That means that anybody who finds that secret, whether they find it from the user API somehow or they find it from the do API, they now can sign tokens that are indistinguishable from those that are signed by the user API, which again is unsanitized credentials. Um, not unsanitized, excuse me. It is a way for someone to generate their own set of credentials that they want. Whereas if you have a private key in the user API and, and the two API just looks at the public key, well, if the two API is compromised somehow, it's not, I mean, obviously it's a big deal. Compromise is always a big deal, but it's not like someone can start issuing JSON web tokens on their own now, because all I have is the public key. So why would you avoid, I mean, I've just laid out two fantastic reasons to use an asymmetric key pair. And that is typically what we recommend but it is important to know the trade-offs. It's a little bit slower and it's more complex. So as far as sharing public keys, you have a couple options uh, and we'll walk through those. The first is you can distribute the keys. 
right? Uh, so here we need our public key in the to-do API somehow. We can actually bundle it. And the nice thing about bundling it as a part of the deployment architect artifact is that the to-do API now has no need to contact the user API. They can be on disjoint networks. Uh, the to-do API doesn't need to know anything about the user API. It doesn't need to contact it in any way, shape, or form. The downside, of course, is that you have a limited number of public keys. Even if you ship 100 with the zoo API, um, if you rotate the private key, which is used to sign the, the public keys, eventually you'll run out of public keys. Or sorry, you'll eventually have a jot that is signed by a private key that doesn't have a corresponding public key unless you go through the deployment process again. So more common uh, solution is to allow network connectivity between the to-do API and the user API, but have it be kind of um, happen pretty rarely and have an endpoint where the to-do API can reach out to the user API and say, hey, give me all your public keys. And then the to-do API maps between those public keys and a JSON web token that it gets. We'll see a little bit more about that in the future. This is what that JWKS endpoint is at, uh, or what it looks like. So we have a bunch of different information. The thing that's really important is the algorithm and a key identifier, and then a certificate chain. And so that can be used by, again, probably a library to verify a public key, uh, verify a job that is signed with a private key. So the important thing is this key identifier, you starts with UK zero here, it matches, a key identifier in a header, right? This is another piece of metadata that's often in JSON web token. And the key identifier tells the, the library that's validating signature, which public key should I use? Which co public key corresponds to the private key that was used to sign this job? Let's talk about refresh tokens. So jots are supposed to be short-lived minutes you know, sometimes seconds, refresh tokens can be longer lived and refresh tokens can be used to create new JSON web tokens. Why would you use refresh tokens? Well, basically there's, if you, if, if you live in a world without refresh tokens, you have two bad options. The first is every time a job expires, right? And you might make it good for two minutes or five minutes, the user has to authenticate again to get a new job. That's obviously a lot of hassle. I don't know about you, but I don't really like authenticating. And so most people don't either. And so you want to minimize that. But if you say, okay, screw it. I'm not going to make people authenticate every five minutes. I'm going to make my job good for two years. Then anybody who steals that job finds act, get act, gets access to it now has two years to exploit it. And don't forget, they know that because it's in the job itself, right? The expiration date is in the job. So that's obviously a really bad situation. So how a refresh token works is basically the user API um, generates a refresh token as well as a jot. The refresh token is passed to the client and then the client presents, uh, stores out, save, store, bleh, excuse me, stores both of these safely. The client presents the JSON web token to the two API back and forth, back and forth, right? Eventually that jot expires after two minutes, say, and then the client catches the refresh token, or sorry, catches the, the expiration error, right? Somehow I can't go to the two API anymore. It's, it's giving me 401s. I'm going to present the refresh token to the user API. And maybe I'll get a new jot that's good for another two minutes. And so back and forth, you can do that. Obviously now the refresh token is a really important piece of credential that needs to be stored safely um, because it can be used to mint new J JSON web tokens. Uh, logging out in jot based systems basically means revoking the refresh token. So if a user clicks, clicks log out in the client, the refresh token, um, they basically call the user API, say, hey, delete this refresh token or mark it, mark it done. And then they destroy the JSON web token and the refresh token on the uh, on the client. The one thing that's worth noting is that you can't really revoke the JSON web token. If it's out there, it's out there. That's that's the flip side of being a stateless solution. So a question we often get is, 
how do you revoke refresh tokens? Or sorry, how do we revoke JSON web tokens? And the answer is that you can do it in a couple of ways. You can kind of revoke it. You can rotate keys. And so basically, because every consumer of a JSON web token should be validating a key, uh, validating that the signature is correct, if you go out to that public key uh, situation, or if you check your secret and the secret's different, um, if the public key doesn't exist, excuse me, and the, or, or if it's a symmetric key and the key doesn't exist anymore, then that validation is going to fail. But that is going to rotating keys basically invalidates a whole class of JSON web tokens, right? Anything that's signed with that job, any job that's signed with that key. Um, that's a little harsh for someone logging out once. Another option is to have really short lifetimes so that you're continually calling out to that refresh token to get new JSON web tokens. And the, uh, again, because logout is always going to invalidate that refresh token, if someone's logged out, then you won't get a job back. And then, uh, so that's not really revocation, that's more of an architectural choice. The last is a, a deny list. And so how that works is when the, rev uh, the refresh token revocation happens, you can push out an event to uh, all the APIs that might be consuming that JSON web token, and then they can add that JOT or uh, basically add information about that JOT to the, um, to just like a key value store, right? And then now every time a validation event uh, occurs, they should check against that key value store to say, hey, if I seen it, is this JOT a JOT that's been, that is associated with the refresh token that's been revoked. So uh, I'm going to wrap up and then I think we'll have some Q&A. Here's some additional information. We have uh, a, a JOT debugger out there, which you can paste a JOT in. If you, in case you don't believe me that there's no secrets with a JOT, uh, that JavaScript example is right here. Um, and then I have a couple of articles that I've written about the insides of JSON Web Tokens. And then if you want to download FusionAuth and play around with it, the Community Edition is 100% free, runs on Mac, Windows, Linux. Uh, it's available via Docker and, and there's some other solutions. So if you want to play around with an auth server, feel free to do so. And let's uh, take some questions and feel free to contact me. You can follow me on Twitter. You can check out Fusion Auth and you can email me if you have any questions. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dan. That was truly awesome. <clears throat> well, I'm not surprised. I know that you're a boss in that. So great talk as expected. And yeah, as you mentioned, we have some time for questions now. So feel free to to ask those in the chat uh, and I will read those out loud. Please paste the links in the chat. Yeah, I will share the presentation later in the community. Uh, so it will be easier for you to follow those links. Uh, and just to associate it with the uh, presentation itself. So, uh, Dan, if you feel like you want to share something specific in the chat right now, which is like the most important, sure, you can I do can do that. I can, I can paste those. Yeah, those are pretty. Um, let me go ahead and. The first question we have, or do you want me to wait until you paste? No, that's fine. All right. Yeah, because I can do that. My brain is single threaded, just as JavaScript. So, uh, <laughs> I get it. So, yep. Uh, the first question we have is like, how safe is JWT over HTTPS? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, great question. Great point. We should always send JOTs over HTTPS. Um, even over HTTP, they can be, because they're signed, you can be sure of the, the provenance of them, right? Because even if someone intercepts uh, an HTTP message, if they tweak the, the contents of the JSON web token, right? If they change the role from editor to admin, the signature is not gonna match. So you ha still have some security around it. Um, I think that, tell me if that didn't answer your question, but I, uh, I think you should do everything over HTTPS, but because of JOT's special nature, they're okay even over HTTP. Okay, we have a reply that that's answered the questions. Question. Oh, great. Awesome. Awesome. Any more questions, folks? Happy to read those out loud. 
If not, you get, you get 10 minutes of your day back. Yep. And yeah, well, it was uh, given the auth as done with customer facing clients UI, how can we still use the API with other testing clients? Postman CLI given auth is backed in, especially if you're testing in a staging and for dev end. Right. So if, if I understand the question, basically you're saying, hey, you just said you should validate the auth, right? Uh, auth, validate the JSON web token, but it's complicated to get a JSON web token. What's the, what's the solution for that? And the answer is that a lot of providers out there, including Fusion Auth, have ways to generate JSON web tokens that don't require full auth, um, that don't require like the authorization code grant to actually get the token. Um, Fusion Auth, for example, has a vending API where if you have an API key, we'll actually, sorry, I don't want to confuse things. If you have like a, a privileged level of access, you can generate any JSON web token you want. So that's probably the way to approach that is for my tests, I'm going to generate a jot that I know, you know, I mean, actually you could even do something like this, right? I'm going to generate a jot I know expires in five minutes and I'm going to have this email and this audience. And I'm going to pass that to my Zoo API with Postman. And then I'm going to um, check to see that the validation is correct, right? And then I'm going to do it where it expires five minutes in the past and guess what? I should get back a 401. So I guess the short answer is you can use a tool like FusionAuth or even something like a library to generate a valid jot. And, uh, you know, obviously it doesn't test the full throughput of your system, but that, that should be enough to test like the validation portion of it. Awesome. The next one is any security advantages of using JWT on monolithic application? So, yeah, I think that it, it can be a good fit for monolithic applications um, in that you can still um, have, well, let me put it. So by monolithic applications, you mean something where the auth is like wrapped in, like the authentication is like wrapped into the application in general? Um, let me assume that, let me assume that's the, the, the supposition. Um, yes. I would say, the answer was yes. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay, great. Okay, cool. Um, so I guess the answer there would be no, there's probably not an advantage. Um, I think that the advantage comes when you split it out. And I think if you have one application with auth included in it, jots might be overkill. If you have two applications that both have auth in it, guess what? Now you have a problem because now you have two sets of users you need to provision. And what we often see with Fusion Auth is that at that point in time, you actually have, you want to have three applications, right? You have the two monolithic applications and then you have an auth server. And then suddenly you're back in the world with J JSON web tokens and you get single sign on. And, um, in that case, you know, you don't need jots so much as you need single sign-on, and then jots just might be along for the ride at that point. Great question. The next one is, is it safe to say JWTs are a must for microservice architecture? I, I mean, I think that if you're using microservice architecture, you're going to want a couple of layers of authentication. You're going to want um, something that handles microservice and microservice communication, and that typically is client certificates. And then you're going to want something that is kind of handling a request that comes in from the user, and that's typically going to be some kind of token. Um, I think JOTs are a good solution for that. There are other JOT formats. I know, I know there are there, sorry, there are other token formats. I think macaroons are one, Passetto is another that I've looked at. But I think JOTs are a big win just because they're so widely supported. And but I think you that the short answer is no, you don't have to use JOTs. You'll probably want to use some kind of token-based solution though. Awesome. Next one. Is FusionAuth just a GWT provider? 
what other advantage does it have over other providers? Does it help with role, claims, and scope, and GMT? Um, so, thank you for the question. Um, I think FusionAuth has a you know FusionAuth has some other advantages too. It provides user management. It's API first. Um, FusionAuth does not support custom claims right now. Uh, that's on our roadmap. Uh, sorry custom scopes. So it doesn't support custom scopes right now. It's on our roadmap. Um, it does uh, have some options. Basically, we have like a what we call lambdas, which is a confusing name because it's totally separate from AWS Lambda, but it's basically a way for you to um, execute code on every token generation. And if you have a paid edition, it actually lets you make H A API calls. Um, but even the free edition that lets you like manipulate it however you want um, or manipulate the, the token generation. So you could add scope claims and other things like that. But, um, you know, I think FusionAuth provides user management, it provides single sign-on, it provides uh, group management. Um, there's some other pieces that it provides that are bigger than just like J JWTs. And I think that's one of the one of the wins. Um, I will say that there's a lot of great options out there. I think Fusion Auth is a great one, but um, it, it's definitely worth everyone who's thinking about this kick the tires on a couple of different solutions because your problem space, you know, might might be better served by Fusion Auth or might be better served by some somebody else. And a lot of providers out there, a lot of Auth providers, will give you a free trial. Um, one thing I will say is that I don't think anyone should be rolling their own auth solution anymore. Use an open source library that's built into your framework or use an auth provider. I think that the days of having to write your own password hashing algorithms are behind you for most business developers. I just don't think you should do that anymore. Awesome. Next one. Is it good, safe to say JWT token uh, in the database? I mean, what's your risk profile, right? Like how locked down is your database? JWTs or JSON Web Tokens are essentially time-bound credentials. So would you save a password in a database? Depends on the, the you know, probably not, right? You'd probably hash a password. I think that the JOT, what, you need to think about what it gives access to, how long it's going to be, how long it's going to be living for. Um, you know, I think that you should treat jots as credentials, and to, to before you store them any place, determine what's you know basically threat model. What's going to happen if they get stolen? Um, you know, the you could encrypt them in a database, right? That would be one step to take. Uh, you can't really hash them because you need to get the plain text value out. Um, as opposed to a password. So I guess the answer is, I, I hate to fall back on this, but it depends. Depends on what the JOT is locking down access to and what steps you can take to secure it within that database. Amazing. And I think we have time for the last one. Uh, so between implementing a GWT microservice that issues the GWTs, uh, and making use of an open source identity and access management such as Capoke to handle the token generation, which option is the best? Ah, okay, yeah. So if I understand it correct, your question is basically like, should I, if I have to generate these jots, right? If I'm building that user API to do generation, should I use a solution like FusionAuth or Keycloak or should I roll it myself using an, an open source library? Um, I would probably say it's better to, to use an auth provider like Keycloak or Fusion Auth, um, just because there's a lot of edge cases and there's a lot of, of additional functionality that come along with those. Um, and again, Keycloak is open source, Fusion Auth is free, but not open source. So depending on what your needs are, you can pick the right solution for you. Keycloak is, um, you know, has a lot of features. I've talked to people who've had great experiences with Keycloak, and I've also talked to people who've had tough experiences with Keycloak. So again, kick the tires. But in general, I think 
the class of auth providers. And again, I'm talking my book a little bit, right? Like I'm paid by Fusion Auth, so I want to be clear about that. But like, I think the class of auth providers just give you so much, so many things more than writing it based on an open source library that I think they're worthwhile. The one case where I'd say write it based on open source library is if you're like super constrained in terms of like memory or time, um, you know, execution, then maybe you want to go use like um, a performant open source library to issue those jots. But my guess is that you're going to start out issuing just jots and then you're going to want, oh, you're going to be like, oh, I want to add user management. Oh, I want to add scope handling. Oh, I want to add yada, yada, yada. And then you'll, you'll start to build your own auth provider, which is, um, you know, not really the kind of code that you want to be writing. Fantastic. Uh, and oh, I guess we have one more. Uh, sure. So is it possible to make GWZ token invalid before expire time? Right. So that's a revocation question. And, you know, we talked about a couple of different ways you can do that. So that would be rotating the keys or using this kind of um, deny list functionality. And, you know, I think it's really worth saying that like the, the the issue with not being able to revoke a jot before the expiration time is the flip side of not having to contact a central server to, to determine the validity of a, a JSON web token. You can't really have both of those properties. And so um, if you wanna be able to revoke a jot like at a moment's notice, then essentially you're back to like session management where you have one central server or back to that opaque token solution that I, I mentioned, right? Uh, where's the opaque token slide? There we are right here. You know, this opaque token, every time you're uh, getting that token, you're going to validate it, which means it's super easy to revoke because you just fire off a request to the user API and say, hey, revoke token X. And the next time a request comes in, the to-do API is going to check it with the user API and then it's going to be revoked. But that means that it's going to be very chatty and it's going to couple the user API to everything. So it's an architectural choice that you have to, you have to make. Awesome. Well, we don't have any more questions in the chat. Um, the time is kind of up. So if you folks have any questions, you can send it to community. I will just forward it to Dan, or you can reach him in person on Twitter or any other way he provided. So um, yeah, thank you once again, Dan. Uh, this was a really amazing talk. I really enjoyed it personally. And I'm quite confident that every single person who joined uh, our call today had the same emotions. Uh, so we're really excited having you. We're really excited to have you on the future calls. So thank you so much. And thank you every single person who joined us today. Uh, I will share the presentation and the recording in the Slack later on. Um, and thank you and have an amazing day. And I hope to see you all soon on our next events. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone.